Hi, I'm Ben Furman. And I'm Nate Blyton. This is Patch In, the show from SoundNotion.tv dedicated to the wonderful world of electroacoustic music. Let's start with some news items. Good news for Chet Udell. Um, his e-immersion Kickstarter is completely funded. In fact, they, they overshot the 7500 7, goal and got over $11,000. Congratulations, and um, yeah, now we can look forward to seeing the immersion technology really emerge. For all of you programmers out there with iPads, C-Sound is now available on the iPad. Uh, this is huge because it is the first audio programming language that's available in a portable form. So I've downloaded it. I have no idea how to use it. But <laughs> fortunately, there are some really awesome and freely available uh, free and open source manuals through flossmanuals.net. Uh, we'll definitely have links up to that after the show. I think you have to be much older to be a C-Sound user. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, C-Sound's been around for a while, but the C-Sound 6 it seems to have made it a lot more flexible to, such that people can make apps like this. And so it's pretty exciting stuff. Um, it, 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 <laughs> other exciting things, more in the hardware direction. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen this iConnect MIDI. It's billed as a hyper-connected, networkable, multi-host MIDI interface and with audio pass-through <laughs> trademarked for Mac, PC, and iOS. So what so, does that mean, Nate? <laughs> well, holy cow, it means that uh, for, a little, for just around $250, you'll be able to get something that will uh, connect. It's a single MIDI and audio interface that you can connect to <laughs> two computers, cross-platform, and also an iOS device. Um, so, like, they... they that you could use some app on your lap or on your um, on your tablet and have it natively like control from your digital audio workstation, or uh, ha send audio back and forth between your iPad and your Mac and your PC and have it just all work fabulously. And it's pretty exciting for me. I'm not sure exactly when this is coming out, but we'll we'll be able to have these pretty soon, I believe. Nice. Yeah. I definitely want one of those. Uh, but speaking of other things that I want, uh, Moog has released a sub fatty. Uh, they already have the sub fatty out and have had it out for years. The difference is this one has Braille face plates on it. So they're finally uh, kind of acknowledging the uh, legacy of Stevie Wonder with their products and releasing actual Braille Moog devices now. Starting yeah. with the sub fatty, but they've said that if that takes off, they might go in... Uh, other directions as well. Yeah. Seems like a nice feature to me. Um, another uh, other things from Moog. Uh, so Ben has been all about the Theramini. He's got his pre-ordered and everything, but unfortunately, it's uh, the release has been delayed, so you can't quite get him yet. But we're looking out for him soon. Yeah, that's funny because when they announced it, uh, a bunch of people on a lot of theremin and audio gear forums were complaining that it would be the death of the theremin, that no one would buy it. But if they're having issues fulfilling orders, I think that that's probably wrong. <laughs> um, one other thing that affects every one of us, uh, yesterday the FCC proposed new rules for the Internet. Uh, they call it the net neutrality rules. It is anything but. Uh, there are two types, uh, sets really, of rules that are under proposal right now and that they are seeking comment on. Um, unfortunately, one of those proposed sets of rules threatens to create a two-tiered internet where content providers would have to pay more money to access a faster lane to consumers. Uh, of course, SoundNotion.tv being a content creator and the three of us on the panel all being content creators, this is a really bad thing for us personally, but also for you, our loyal viewers, because potentially that would mean that we would have to start maybe charging more for audio files or scores or whatever. So uh, they are currently taking comments on that. I encourage everyone to go through the FCC comment page and let them know exactly how this affects you and how you feel, uh, being as eloquent and potentially explicit as possible. Mm. Uh, definitely have a link up for that. That will take <laughs> you directly to the page. Recommend the, the highly reliable F, uh, EFF for information about yes. how the internet works. The, one of the biggest problems with this, and i sorry to butt into your fun show, 
uh, <laughs> is that to understand what actually is going on is far beyond anybody but a network systems engineer. And so we only are able to talk about it in analogies. Uh, but try your best to figure out what's going on because it is important, like Ben said. Sorry, mm -hmm. you can People have your show that I back. know who are network engineers or who work for Google or Apple are freaking the hell out about this. So that alone should tell you that this is a really bad idea when both those companies are agreeing that this is bad. It's bad. <laughs> yeah. And thanks uh, for the extra word. Our, that's our show engineer, David McDonald. Um, on a lighter note, <laughs> I don't know if you've... Uh, if this uh, And also in the show notes, we're going to have a link to this. But there's an interesting article out there for a, a YouTube video that's been going around. I don't know if you've ever wondered what exactly those tree rings on, on the stump in the backyard might sound like on a record player. Like if you were able to put a needle in the in in the ring and hear it go around, um, well, there's a <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce his name Bartholomew Traubach, maybe something like that. He uh, he put together a one of a kind record player, as they say in the article. It uses a PlayStation Eye camera and a stepper motor and feeds the data into Ableton Live uh, to to generate a piano track that you can so you can kind of. <laughs> in a roundabout kind of way, hear what these rings sound like. It's, a, it's an interesting video, and I recommend you check it out. Yeah, it's definitely that round sounds shady to me. player is uh, involved. Seems like that would be entirely dependent on how the log is cut. <laughs> oh, totally. <laughs> like, the ring is just a ring because we cut the tree down. It's not a ring normally. It's a tube. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you've ever encountered electronic music where it's a data source that doesn't necessarily map very well to <laughs> <laughs> but I've heard one, about this tell yeah. me more <laughs> no no well I mean we may get into it this is after all our electronic music podcast and stuff yeah. but I uh, I wanted to move on uh, so that that about wraps it up for our uh, our news items for today Ben could you introduce our guest absolutely our guest today is composer saxophone player, uh, pedagogue, and beer aficionado, uh, Eric Honor, professor at the University of Central Missouri. Eric, welcome to Patch In. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. It's good to see you guys. You too. Yeah, I'll echo the net neutrality thing, too. That sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, only, the only people who are behind that are the, the cable companies. You know, I mean, those are the people who really, really want to see it happen. And, I mean, I don't know anybody who doesn't hate their cable company. So well, because you don't have an option. Right. right. And, you know, like, how could anything that they want possibly be good? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> no, that's a terrible <laughs> idea. So. Right. And not to wax too much on this topic, but uh, FCC Commissioner Tom Wheeler did formerly work as a lobbyist for the cable industry and for, I believe it was AT&T as well. Yeah. Well, for so the, the telecom industry, there are two big lobbies. There's the one yeah. that does cable, and there's the one that does wireless telephones, and he's been the lead lobbyist for both of those organizations and is in the Hall of Fame of both of those organizations. Right. <laughs> and, you know, with Washington, it's not like, you know, you get done working at the FCC and then go and retire somewhere. You go back to lobbying for one of those yep. two main areas. So this is a... It seems very shady and very much like he's looking for job security in the future when his tenure's done. Yep. Not that I'm insinuating anything. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, on a lighter note, um, Eric. Yes. So I have been uh, enjoying um, reading some of your Facebook comments, in particular about uh, your students' finals for creating music for video games. Yeah. And how that has forced you, against your will, I might add, to play video games and I believe the quote was to blow stuff up. Right, to blow for stuff grades. up. That sounds terrible. I know, it's, it's rough. It's <laughs> very rough. Um, yeah, it's um, the, the, the university where I teach, University of Central Missouri, is the state institution in Missouri for professional and applied technology. And so we have this Bachelor of Music and Music Technology degree that is, um, you know, it's not a composition degree. And of course, I'm a composer, and that's that's my training. Uh, but that's never been kind of the purpose behind this degree. We we get into composition quite a lot, um, but you know, it's really anything related to technology and music and the intersection of those two things is what we cover. So, kind of the the primary. 
focus of the degree program is audio production, audio engineering, um, you know, live sound reinforcement, and then we get into to composition and electronic music and you know some of that kind of stuff. But a few years back, we, um, we, me, I, uh, kind of reconfigured the curriculum a little bit to create courses that are a little bit more focused on certain particular aspects of music and audio technology. Um, and as part of that whole thing, I created this course called Audio for X. And the idea behind that class is that it's audio for non-musical environments. So we deal with uh, field recordings, we deal with you know the creation of audio scenes, sound design, audio for video, and then at the end of the semester, audio for game. And so these final projects, yeah, they, there's, um, you know, there's there's this kind of free game uh, floating around out there. There was a, a competition that that happened. Um, I guess it was earlier this this year, um, or not a competition, but but an opportunity for people to play with this game and do their own sound design, and they get feedback from game audio professionals. And so I just assigned it to all of my students. I said, go download the software, install it, go ahead and you know try this out, see how it works. Um, and uh, the game is in the Unity 3D. Uh, game engine. If you guys know that one, it's a it's a great oh, yeah. cross-platform game engine. Um, and then the idea behind this particular project was they took the Angry Bots game that ships with Unity as sort of the the stock default sample, um, and they came up with a special version of it that integrates with FMOD Studio, which is a, a a really nice game audio development platform. And so what I did was I said to my students, you have to go download this specific thing because actually. FMOD integration with Unity, that's a pro feature that you have to pay a lot extra for, and, you know, it's this whole thing. But this one particular um, opportunity they came up with, they had a special version of FMOD Studio that you downloaded and a special version of, of Unity that you downloaded, and with those, it would work. Um, so I had my students download that, install it on their own systems, and, you know, do, do the project, and then at the end of the semester, you know, I got to play the game and see, well, how did their sound work, you know? And it was it was really pretty cool, you know. They um, they came up with some really interesting ways to make the music adaptive. You know, one of the cool mm -hmm. things about FMOD and the the way that it integrates with Unity is that you can relatively easily uncover parameters that are built into the game, and then use those to influence sound in one way or another. So, for example, there's a, a parameter that there's a flag that gets thrown for combat moment that you're in combat, you know, Unity sends out this flag saying, hey, we're now in combat, and then FMOD can react to that, and you can sculpt the way that it reacts and say, well, now that we're in combat, we're going to ramp up combat music over so many milliseconds, and then the moment the combat flag gets turned off, you know, we can ramp back down to just our general ambient music. And so it's a really simple way to create adaptive music that, you know, depends on game parameters. That's as far as we go with it in that course. But you know, some of my students have already expressed an interest in kind of taking it to the next level and saying, well, the next composition I create, maybe I'll try composing directly into Unity, where instead of trying to make you know, interactive music via Max or via Super Collider or some of the other platforms that, that people use, maybe I'll just go ahead and do it as a game you know, and see, see how that works. Um, yeah. I think that's, you know, for me, that's, that's one of the things that I really try to stress with my students. You know, I have my own preferred tools, and we all do, you know. Um, I don't necessarily, you know, force my students to work with those tools. I, I, don't, I don't take a position in particular. I kind of serve as an example to say, well, this is what I do, and this is what a lot of people do. But I also try to, you know, maintain a, at least a, a feeling for what else is going on out there in the world and say, you know, I saw this one guy was using Super Collider and it seemed to work really, really well for him. I don't use Super Collider, but if you want to, it's available, it's free, go check it out, you know? And it, it is much more about the output and about the process in, with my students and with my courses than it is necessarily about any particular tool, you know? Um, this particular game project, we, we specified tools because, you know, none of them had done anything like this before, and I thought it would make, make, make it easier if I said, well, let's do this, you know? Um, but when it comes to, you know, like the sound design work, some of them were working in Ableton Live, some of them were working in Mac, some of them were working in Pro Tools or in Logic, you know, kind of what, whatever they want to use, as long as they end up outputting sound design that works for the assignment, I could care less what tools they use. Right. I mean, well, and that brings up an interesting issue, which is that tools change, but they also affect how you work. I mean, I yeah. find that if I'm writing within Pro Tools, I write one way. If I'm writing in Ableton Live, I write in a very different way. Um, do you see a lot of that coming through in both your students' work and then in your own work as well? Yeah, ab absolutely. Absolutely both. Um, you know, one of the things that my students um, 
kind of discovered this semester. A, a whole bunch of them were looking for just kind of new things to do. They, they felt like they were certainly not stymied by Pro Tools, but they felt like they'd done everything in Pro Tools that they wanted to do for the moment, you know, and they were looking for something that was more interactive and something that would give them some new possibilities. Um, and one of them discovered Audio Mulch. I, I think I missed, oh, yeah. mentioned it in a class, you know, and I said, you know, you might want to check out Audio Mulch. It's, it's, a, it's a cool environment. Um, and I'm not really an Audio Mulch user. I mean, I've, I've played with it and that's, it's cool, you know, but it's, I got enough on my plate already without taking on another platform, you know. Um, but I mentioned, I was like, you know, hey, it, it's, it's a cool thing. You might want to check it. The next thing you know, like six people in the class are all running Audio Mulch and it profoundly affected what they put out, you know. So in addition to the, the Audio for X class, this was also the semester that we teach our electronic composition course. And a, a number of those students were in both of those classes. At the end of the semester for electronic composition, it's a course requirement that they um, have a piece on our final concert of the semester. This particular semester, the, the one requirement I gave them was that their piece must involve live performance by a human somehow. You know, could be that the human is performing on a synthesizer. It could be that the human is twisting knobs or push, pressing buttons on a laptop. It could be that the human is playing saxophone and the computer is doing something with it. You know, I, I don't care, but there has to be a live human on stage somehow. Yeah. And, you know, so getting back to the audio mulch thing, all of a sudden out of nowhere, five or six of them are saying, okay, well, my piece is going to be uh, acoustic performer with audio mulch, you know? And it does, it profoundly affects the way that they work because once they start seeing, well, what's easy to do in audio mulch, what can I do with a relative minimum of effort, um, they immediately start to follow down that particular track. Um, and I don't think that that's best by any stretch of the, of the imagination. You know, I think what's best is to, to do and accomplish what it is you want to do and accomplish. But I mean, there, there can't be any doubt that the tools that you have in front of you, you know, profoundly affect the way that you work. It, it's like the old adage about, well, when all you have is a hammer, everything starts looking like a nail. You, you yeah, know? right. <laughs> and, and when all I've got is audio mulch, everything starts to look like, you know, granular processing. Like I'm gonna, because it's really easy to do that in, in, in that particular environment. Yeah, uh -huh. and I kind of related to um, what or you. So you touched on this a little bit earlier. The the software that you use would affect the kind of composition that you do. But I the the medium in which you're com composing also <laughs> profoundly changes it a lot. We uh, we haven't really talked about video game music very much in t as a format, and uh, yeah. it's really interesting to me just the because um, we've we've talked about different kinds of interactive composition where you. Like something that you're doing uh, changes like a, a Q and Max or something like that, or that your audio is getting processed and is turned into this wash of sound that you end up hearing through the speakers. But uh, the video game format that you mentioned, uh, it feels even more to me like a choose your own adventure kind of thing, where it's like the, <laughs> the listener <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. is is really like affecting the the pacing of the music as it goes and that's that's a really interesting thing to me to um to compose in a format like that where the formally the the structure is different uh, did you yeah. find that your students were <laughs> coming up with some really different things in that format or yeah you know um yes and no it's um the stuff that they did was primarily um ambient music you know that could you know it, Sometimes it was multiple loops that would come into sync with each other, and it's very, um, it's not particularly, most of it was not particularly pitch-based. It was mostly textures and, and clouds and washes that would come and go and would, you know, sort of create a, an amalgam that was this ambient texture, you know. And then when combat would occur more often, then we'd start to get some percussion, we'd start to get some, you know, stuff that was moving along a little bit more. I, I think... You know, I think it's it's one of those things that um, a lot of it, it's not a common area for for people to study in in composition courses or, or anything like that. Video game music is kind of its own thing. You know, right. um, it's beginning to become much more of a factor. Uh, and you know, there was a, a fantastic book um, out on Oxford uh, University Press with I guess it was about two years ago now uh, that Karen Collins wrote, um, which is one of the textbooks for my course. Um, and you should check it out because it's a great overview of the history of electronic or, uh, video game music and some of the issues associated with it, even down to 
kind of again getting back to the medium affecting the music down yeah. to the limitations that were built into early video game systems by virtue sure. of the specific sound chips they had available well these are the only sounds you can make so that's yeah. what it is you know right. um, but i think the um i think it's interesting to me that there are so many composers now who are exploring the idea of interactivity in music and adaptivity in music and that has been you know pretty current in video games for quite a while now you know i mean really a very long since the inception of video games it, depending on how broadly you want to define that interactivity you know um but certainly you know a lot of cu current games are they are interactive music pieces. They happen to have video along with them. I think the downside to it is also that explosions. that's right. Also, <laughs> drops, right? but I think you know the other thing about it is that that's not what they're intended to be, and that's not the way people conceive of them. You know, and I right. think that there are at the same time. Uh, sorry to butt in. There are at the same time uh, video games that are intended as a musical environment. Uh, oh, sure. You have yeah. Electroplankton for the Nintendo DS, um, music, M U S Y C for iOS, mm -hmm. and yeah. other similar programs that are starting to come in to their own now in that yeah, respect. Yeah. Or well, even I mean, like I, Biophilia, the yeah, release I mean, yeah. for, for Guitar Hero is kind of like being a huge success along the same lines of, well, it's quasi-musical performance, you know? Um, but, but I think what's interesting about it is that there, there's the, it seems like there's this fertile ground for exploration between composers and video game developers that hasn't yet really gelled, you know? Mm -hmm. and, I, and there are a number, I mean, I know of, of a number of composers who are out there working in the field right now um, who are doing a lot of experimentation with, you know, interactivity via video game controller or that kind of thing. But what I haven't seen very much of yet is the actual next step of getting beyond the controller to the actual process of making this music is the process of playing a game. I've seen a little bit of it here and there, but I think it's it's a it's a possibly rich field for people to explore. Um, right. And I think, you know, getting back to that same comment we were talking about before, some of the tools that exist for video game development might open up avenues of expression for composers that are sure. really quite different from the avenues that we're all exploring so far. Um, and that that's always fun for me anyway. You know? <laughs> yeah, I, I was wondering like, if the, the Unity 3D and FMOD Studio combination, if those are still available, those specific downloads that you I found that linked the two? Yeah, I believe they are. It was a um, uh, G-A-N-G, -G, the gang, which is the Game Audio Network Guild, I think. Okay. Um, if I remember right, um, but you know, if somebody were to do a Google search for Unity and FMOD integration, it, it, pretty early on in the hits, you're going to turn up something for a lot of Awesome, cool. Um, well, and I, the, if I remember right, it was the. I think the thing started up in January of 2014, and cool. people had to have stuff done by like early March of 2014. So likely, it's still out there. You know, right Brilliant. now. Cool. We'll include that in the show notes then for sure. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, on the idea of interactivity, um, you're an electronic music composer and a performer, so you see a lot of interactive pieces. Um, and you also talked about the idea of things that composers aren't doing a lot. Um, listening to Phantasm for alto sax and computer, um, I'm always struck by one thing that you're doing that not a lot of people are which is that you start off with a clear and very concise groove, the 12-8 section in part one, yeah. and that that stays there throughout all of part one, that you don't change out of that 12-8 until you get to part two. Yeah, and um, it develops over time, but yeah, you're right. It's, it's yeah. absolutely groove-driven, yeah. Um, is that purely reactionary to uh, the kind of the current trend <laughs> of... Anything goes in electronic music and the Bjork idea of everything is music and everything is rhythm and let's have no bar lines whatsoever. Um, or is it just what you want to hear and what you want to work with compositionally? I mean, I think it's I think it's more it's it's much more the latter than the former. I, I don't I, you know, frankly, I don't have time to <laughs> care very much about what a what 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 I'm supposed to do or not supposed to do, you, you know what right. I mean? Yeah. Um, the I have two.
two small kids at home. I have a full time job. Like I barely have time to compose as it is. And if I <laughs> if I let myself dwell a really long time on, well, you know, is is it okay to include a group, or or you know, is everybody gonna frown on that? You know, I'll I'll never get the project started. And the the truth is that you know some of the music I write um, is I think very much more in the experimental tradition, and you know, away from popular music and away from groove and, and away from beats and, and that kind of stuff. And then some of the pieces that I write, like that's part of my language. It's part of the music that I grew up listening to. But for me, that's my folk music, you know, in the same way that, that Bartok or, or, you know, some of these other composers were, were so influenced by the folk music that they grew up hearing. Well, that's my folk music. That, that's what it is. That's what I grew up hearing. I'm a product of late 20th century United States, and that's that's my culture, you know, um, for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. And I think that what I do endeavor to do that is a little, you know, I have to say too, again, remember what it is that I teach and the other big part of my career, which is that I am an audio engineer. I am an audio producer. I work with rock bands. I work with jazz acts. You know, I, I teach people how to make popular music records. And that's a big part of what our degree program here is. Um, and so it, it can't help but influence my own musical thinking that I do that regularly, you know? But I think a big difference between what I try to do when I incorporate those sorts of elements in music that I think of as being more experimental or something that fits sort of the electroacoustic community a little bit better than straight up EDM would, you know, mm -hmm. is that I do try to bring to it the sensibilities of a classical or at least a classically trained composer, you know, okay. things develop over time, both timbrely with regard to the, the surface structure, the mid-level structure. You know, I'm thinking about it in these um, kind of modernist terms. I just happen to be working with materials that don't sound modernist at all, you know? Yeah. And, and I think that, um, you know, there, yeah, in my career, I've, I've run into some people who pushed back against that pretty hard. To which I say, hey, you know, that's fine. You don't have to like it, you know, and and I I don't in any way feel like, um, you know, that that they're wrong because I think that you know quality is very much a, a subjective factor. Um, I, I think it's really hard to nail down objective quality in music, um, but I, I like to be able to say that it's interesting to me, and it's interesting both when I strap on my audio producer and audio engineer ears. And also when I strap on my, you know, highly trained composition slash classical performer ears, that I can say there's something more there than just a loop that repeats and uh, repeats and repeats, right? And you hear that in that 12-8 section that you mentioned, you know, that it goes from this kind of very sort of purist bembe groove kind of thing, and then over time it gets more and more digitally distorted and further and further out there into noise music before it finally just kind of disament, you know, disappears into a cloud of, of granular synthesis. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then there's other there's other layers in there too, you know. Like so, in that particular thing, you you actually hear a sort of a, a harp uh, at the beginning that's that's going along with the groove. But then after you hear it play its thing once, it, each of the elements of it are chopped up, and then there's a max patch that every time I perform that work is reordering those elements, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it's never the same twice. It's there. It's definitely in rhythm, but. You know, it might be that the first dotted quarters worth of stuff is now shifted over three beats and is replaced by something from further on in the groove. Um, you know, and those are the kind of touches that for me say we've kind of taken this beyond just a straight up, you know, dubstep production, yeah. which I also love. Right. But this is something that is supposed to be listenable beyond just does it have a groove? Is it danceable to? Oh, yeah, there's actually some structure there that if you choose to, you can follow that through and and sort of um, appreciate it intellectually as well as orally. Right. One of the reasons why I'm bringing that topic up is that I've seen similar uh, moves from other composers as well. Uh, Mark Snyder, Jason Bolte, just to name the two that spring to my head the fastest. Um, and I'm seeing this as kind of a really positive trend in modern composition, and specifically in electronic music, to move away from some of the uh, perceived elitism and to try and engage with the public in ways that are not just bombarding them with timbres and granular synthesis uh, and the ubiquitous metal and wood sounds that you hear in every uh, electroacoustic concert that you'll ever go to. 
Yeah. Um, are you seeing similar things uh, within uh, the work of other composers that you know and then within your students' work as well? Well, definitely within my students' work um, mm -hmm. because they, of course, are coming from a very, very pop music place to begin with. And so with them, it's much more of a, do I see their basically straight-up popular music productions beginning to incorporate some stuff from other traditions. Uh, yes. And, yes, you know, um, which is great because that's that's what I want to see coming out. You know, I, I try to, any student graduating from my program would be able to sit down with any rock band, country band, you know, it's just, just typical music production and be able to turn out a polished, well-crafted, you know, CD of that. But what I really hope to do is then to have them go the next step and say, not only can I do that, but when you're stuck looking for something to do to take your record to the next place that nobody's expecting it to go, I've got all these other techniques that I can bring to, to bear on, on that issue. You know what I mean? Um, in terms of other, you know, sort of professional or, you know, postgraduate composer types, yeah, I, I do see quite a bit more of it. And I think it's really refreshing, frankly. Um, you know, the... I am the last person in the world to say, you know, you you, you need to be doing this, you know that, and and I, I just don't operate that way. I don't think that way. I still very much appreciate, um, you know, the work of uh, Delaney Lilios, right? And and yeah. she's, I mean, she's wonderful. She's a fantastic composer. She's not working with Groove. That's like that's not her thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Great. I, I don't need to hear groove. You've got you've got some killer music going on. So the, I I don't need to hear that. You know what I mean? But I also, when somebody shows up and just starts to lay down some some groove, I'm like, that's cool too. I, I think that's that's awesome, if it's done well. You know, and that for me is what it really comes down to. And and, and again, it is sub, it's always subjective. It has to be subjective. You know, but for me, when I'm listening to the music. Do I relate to it? Do I listen to it and say, you know, that's done really, really well? Um, and that, you know, in a lot of ways, that comes again from those audio producer engineer ears where it's my job to listen for quality regardless of genre, regardless of what we're trying to do, you know, musically. It's like, well, does it work in the context that you're trying to create here? Does it work? Um, mm -hmm. And that, you know, that for me is, is the most important thing. Um, I think it, it was really kind of interesting. I was at the ICMC this past summer in Perth in Australia. Nice. And, um, yeah, it was it was awesome. It was fantastic. I heard some just amazing music down there. Um, and one of my other recent works that is also very groove oriented, which is Quark for bass clarinet and computer, um, mm -hmm. that was the work that was performed there. And um, there there were a, yeah there were a couple of people who just clearly felt like that piece did not belong on that conference. <laughs> and, yeah, like, what, what the hell is this doing here? What is this pop track? Yeah, right? exactly, exactly. Which yeah. is, you know, again, it's kind of funny to me because you could never spin that on a pop radio. Like you could, never <laughs> spin that. it would bring the club to a screeching halt. If you tried. It would, it wouldn't work. You know. We should try it. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> For science. Yeah. Um, you know, but the fact that it has these hip hop grooves in it and that kind of stuff, like immediately, was enough to to say say no. But what you know, what really struck me is that there were a couple of the keynote speakers who are inarguably among the leading figures of electronic music. I mean, we're, you know, people I have a tremendous amount of respect for as composers and, and as leaders in our field. You know, but there's one in particular I remember in, in the keynote speech was complaining and saying, you know, how long is it going to take for people to start to appreciate what we do? You know, how long is it going to take for us to start to get the kind of crowds that, that, you know, we should have. And I just want to say, you know, I think you're out of touch with reality. If, yes. If, if you're making music that is that far, as, as most electroacoustic music is, from what the majority of the population is listening to, I think it's a little rich to then complain that people don't like it, you know, or that, that people don't want to listen to it. Like, that's a decision that you make. And, yeah. and it's a perfectly legitimate decision, you know, because a lot of people at this point then make that turn and say, well, you shouldn't be making that music because people don't like it. And I think that's a load of crap. You should make whatever music you want. Right. To make, you know? yeah. But you don't get to have it both ways. You don't get to say, I'm making something that's really weird and extremely experimental and way outside the comfort zone for the majority of the population and then be surprised when the majority of the population doesn't know what to do with it, you, mm -hmm. you know? Like that's that's the decision you made. So good for you. You you achieved your goal, but 
Like, it's a hard <laughs> goal, you know? Yeah. Um, well, this ties into a discussion I was having uh, over the weekend uh, at a premiere of mine uh, with some saxophone students, uh, which is how do you program in KC this a new week, piece? Saw it on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, that's where I live. Like, I, we, we should have hooked up, but it, it didn't work out. So. All right. Oh, uh, I, I didn't have any time to do anything that weekend other than uh, rehearse. No worries about it, but congrats on the premiere. Thank yeah. you. But that was the discussion I was having with some of the UMKC students. Um, how do you program a new piece in a way that the audience isn't immediately going to hands over the ears, freak out and run outside when they hear living composer <laughs> or see that on the page? Yeah. And I was the only composer on the program that was still alive. There were uh, two transcriptions. Uh, there were some other works for saxophone specifically, but by established huh. and deceased composers. So it was a very accessible program. That's interesting for a sax recital, but, but yeah, that, right. <laughs> yeah, that's a little unusual for a saxophone recital to have only one living composer. But right, go ahead. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So speaking of which, you're a you're a saxophone player as well, and uh, and uh, and a. I've seen video of you playing your own saxophone music, which um, I imagine must be an interesting context, because um, as, as as composers building interactive pieces, we have to work really hard to make sure that the this other performer knows how to make it work. <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, and have you, uh, how how has that been? I mean, so being a performer yourself and potent like writing for yourself sometimes, I imagine, and writing for other people. Do you ever write things differently for yourself, knowing that like you know how to do it and <laughs> put it together that you might not do for other people? Or yeah, I I mean I am trying to think past the premiere to other people playing playing the piece. Um, there have been a couple of instances in works for saxophone where I've written stuff that I know that I can do that, and I'm. By the way, there are so many saxophonists who are so much more skilled than I am. But there's, there are a couple of particular tricks that I can do that apparently are difficult for a lot of other people. Um, okay. And so I've got one piece in particular where I go really, really, really high. And I got there a very specific way that I knew that I could get there and could do it repeatedly. And I, I don't think anyone else has ever performed that piece because they, <laughs> they downloaded it and they're like, oh, my God, I have to go where on this thing, you know? <laughs> um, and so, you know, that, that hasn't worked out extremely well. But that's been actually, that's been funny recently because the uh, the beer piece that you alluded to earlier on, Handcrafted yeah. Ale. Yes, Handcrafted Ale. Um, yeah, for beer and computer. Um, that's been great. I mean, I'm glad so many people are enjoying it and all that kind of stuff. I've had like seven or eight requests since I put the video on YouTube for people who say, I really want to perform this. And it's like, this piece cannot be performed by anyone else yet. I'm well, I was going to put myself oh. forward as another potential totally performer. Not. So totally. I'm totally down with other people doing it. But, you know, there's a lot of work that still has to happen on my end to be able to yeah. send to somebody else and say, you know, here's what you need to make it to make it work. You know, um, right. right now that piece is... Um, I mean, the, the Max patch is just thrown together. You know, it was, yeah. I, I, I put it together for a, a Kima, Kansas City Electronic Music yep. and Arts Alliance. I uh, put it together for a Kima program in December. And, you know, it was at the end of the semester. It's last minute. I'm like, I have to have this piece done for next week. So none of my typical patching rules apply here. You know, <laughs> stuff is neat. <laughs> and patch cords go only one place. And, you know, it's like, yeah. it's, all, it's a spaghetti. Uh, <laughs> I think everyone here has been there at least yeah, right, exactly. yeah, yeah. many, many times. Um, but, you know, the other thing about that particular work is I, I wanted to use some of the stuff that I've been playing with recently, which is getting away from kind of what's great about Max, which is that if you stick to the built-in stuff, then anybody can do it, you know? Yeah. But it also uses a Cuneo. It also uses multiple microphones. It also, you know, the, the amount of gear involved in that piece is a little bit of a step beyond where I usually try to be for works that I'm going to send out to, to everybody, you know? Mm -hmm. right. But I think it's still totally possible, and, you know, part of it is then, you know, among other things, it uses two um, contact microphones, which, of course, Ben's going to talk about in, in two minutes. Yeah, in, in that's a right. Minute. Uh, well, huh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not in two minutes, maybe. That might be a separate topic. Yeah, um, uh, you know, one, one, I think one part of distributing that piece is going to be going the extra mile to say, 
you don't have a contact microphone? Well, here's how you build one if you want to go ahead and build one. Um, yeah. And if you don't want to do that, then here's some other solutions that would enable it to work. If you don't have a Cuneo and you don't want to obtain one, you're going to need some kind of controllers that can issue these specific controller messages, and it's right. up to you then to figure out how to, how to do that. Um, and so that's some of the, the thinking that I still have to do before I can send it to people and say, yeah, I, I could send it now, but like, good luck, you know, perform because <laughs> you're going to have to do a lot of sort of patch analysis before you can figure out what the hell is going on. Yeah. yeah. So where it's this culture in, of compositions a little bit different than your piano sonata or something. Right. Where you you right. end up being a, a teacher in a lot of ways too, where just to get somebody to be able to get to the point where they'd be able to play it. Yeah, and, you do. You know, and I think it's interesting because it's been my experience anyway, especially in the last three to five years, that more and more and more acoustic performers are getting interested in interacting with electronic music. And that's great, you know, mm -hmm. but so many of them have just zero context for the technical realities and technical necessities of actually doing it. You know, yeah. and so there's a couple different ways to you know to deal with that. My my friends Chris Biggs and and Mauricio Salguero, they you know they did a big tour with clarinet and computer, mm -hmm. but it was relatively easy for Mauricio in that Chris was there the whole time, and Chris is you know he's an expert in these things. Um, when I go on tour, you know I of course know what I'm doing technically because that's a big part of my work. But you know I've I've had some friends who've done, you know my work for trumpet and computer for example, and one of them who went out on the road, it's like this is not what he does. You know, and so somehow dealing with the reality of, well, I put the microphone where and then I have to connect to what? And what, what do you mean I have to launch that software before I launch this software? I mean, Microsoft Office, I just click the W and it's, and it's good. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and, you know, so, yeah, there is a sort of an education thing, which, you know, that's part of the gig. And I think it's, um, I don't know, I find it, I find it really fun to work with those guys because they're into it. And, I'm, you know, it's like, well, if I have to do a little bit of extra work, I'm happy to do that extra work because I'm working with somebody who's really committed and really turned on about the, the topic, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think that, though, actually speaks a little bit. You know, Ben, you were talking about your conversation with the saxophone student, uh, mm -hmm. you can see. And for me, that, by and large, is the secret to how do you program new music without the audience running out. I mean, some of it is having the right audience there in the first place, you know? Um, yeah. Because that's that's a whole other topic of the the sort of classical music music's classical music community's um, ongoing vision of the audience as this monolithic entity that like the same people show up for every concert no matter what, which is ridiculous, you know. Right. Um, but um, what I I don't think there's anything that you can do that is more important than having a really committed performer up on stage, you know. And if the person is up there and they can speak ahead of time and say, you know, this is this is going to be unusual, it's going to be different from what you've heard before, but, you know, I just think this is an amazing piece of music and I want to share it with you and all that kind of thing. My experience, again, has been most of the time when I make that effort as the performer, the audience engages much more than if I just get up and I play a whole bunch of noise and they're like, well, what, the, what was that exactly? Um, yeah. I think it's really great, too when there's an opportunity for feedback after the concert. And I, I always love to try to do that if it's possible to just kind of hang around the stage or hang around the lobby after a performance. And if anybody comes up and has questions or like, what was that thing that right. you, yeah. hey, well, let's talk about it. I, I'd, I'd love to talk about it, you know? Yeah, I mean, if, yeah. So if the audience doesn't speak the language, you teach them a couple of phrases, you know, exactly. give, them, give them something to hold on to. Exactly. In, exactly. In, in this way, uh, your piece, Handcrafted Ale, I think is a really interesting achievement because um, the sonic landscape that it explores, it's, it's very granular synthesis, mm -hmm. putting, putting together these different layers and the sounds end up, like what ends up coming out of the speakers can sometimes be pretty abstract. Mm -hmm. But um, what I love about it is it's so grounded in sounds that people not only might have heard before, but they can see you doing it. Right. Yeah. Like they know <laughs> what it sounds like to kind of ding <laughs> a glass. Yeah. They they've right. held a beer bottle before. They know what it sounds like to do this thing, and yeah. then and then you build this whole landscape out of these sounds with uh, interesting structure and all these things. Yeah. It's really really cool. Right. And the other thing that I noticed in that uh, in the YouTube video at least is 
kind of the incorporation of ritual into mm-hmm. it, where yeah. you're it's, a, it's very much about pouring the beer, you're smelling it, yeah, tasting it, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I, yeah, that's that's exactly right. You know, and for me too, one of the things that that makes it work is that it is bounded structurally by the actual act of drinking a beer. Like this is what is involved in drinking a beer, and that's the way the piece evolves. It's like you know, I drink a beer, you know, like that's what it is, you know. Um, and then I just have these controls available to me that enable me to sort of extend and or augment that experience in various different ways as it's happening, you know? But I don't, like, make a particular effort to take a really long time to drink the beer or to, you know, do stuff that I don't. I mean, it's very common for me. It's not common for me to, like, just, like, fondle the bottle with the bottle opener, you know what I mean? Like, (laughs) I just go straight for the opening. But aside from that, pretty much everything in the video is just like, well, this is what happens when I drink a beer. You know, I open it up. A lot of times I do kind of smell the bottle to see what what I'm smelling. I pour the beer, I drink it, I play with it. You know, it's like that's 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 drinking a beer, you know? The the actual genesis of that work was that I was drinking a beer in that particular glass, which is a a triple Carmelia glass. Um, And, uh, I happened to do the rubbing the rim thing on it, and I was like, wow, this is a really gorgeous sounding glass because it's big and it has this really deep tone. And um, I, had, I had noticed 10 years previously when I was in graduate school playing with a wine glass one night and just seeing how, what the range of pitch is as you drink down. Uh, mm-hmm. Or you know you can also tip the glass and get the, the liquid further up the side of the glass and you also get a glissando that, that way. Um, and I was struck by this particular glass, like how wide that pitch range is, because it's it's you know more than a fifth. It's it's a it's a pretty significant range that, that you can get. Um, and I was like, wow, one of these days I really should do something with that. And then you know I needed to write a piece, and that was it. So I finally finally got to do it. You know, <laughs> um, but that is you know that's one of the things that's been kind of fun about it, because some of the the controls that I've got, it's um. There is there there's there's a granular synthesis engine or a granular processing engine, and then there's also a spectral processing engine. And so as we get um, you know certain pitch components coming out of the glass, the spectral stuff will latch onto that and then freeze it and prolong it and do all that kind of Michael Norrisy stuff that, that gets done with, with spectral stuff, you know. Um, but then in the granular side, I've got all these controls for density and for pitch manipulation and pitch variation and, and that kind of stuff. And so it's fun for me to. You know, a, a big part of the point of that work is to say, here's where we start pitch wise. Now here it is full of beer pitch wise, and then as I drink the beer, we finally rise up back to where we started. So you get almost this kind of not really tonal but sort of tonal closure that we're right. back to where we started right. with, with regard to pitch. Yeah, it's regular all sonata, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the development section is my favorite. You know, uh, oh definitely. <laughs> Turn the glass upside down and backwards. Mm. <laughs> yeah, red beer. Red now, I have to ask, it's awesome. I, I have to ask: Is there any specific beer that you recommend for the performance <laughs> of that work? No, the only thing is that I, I don't want it performed with macro swill. So, like, no fresh, <laughs> no bush. <laughs> That's the only thing I'm saying. You know, ideally it should be performed with homebrew, but if you don't have homebrew available, then any craft beer is is acceptable. Um, okay. Yeah. I've, I mean, I've had I've had some great conversations with people. Like people want to get like a laptop ensemble version for six pack, you know, or they want to <laughs> do an extended version with a 750 milliliter bottle. Or um, yeah. Dave, McIn- Dave McIntyre told me that he wanted me to do a, a three movement version of it. Where he got to pick the three beers, you know. Okay. I was just like, I'm gonna be ripped by the time this is done, you know. Holy cow! Um, I can see. I'm a like, huge fan of Belgians uh, yeah. and Trappist styles, so that would I mean, three movements would kill me. Right. Well, yeah. Exactly. yeah. yeah. Well, right. you know, the one that I used for the video was a homebrewed saison. Uh, okay. So oh. Belgian saison. It's like seven and a half percent alcohol. Yeah. Mm. And I had thankfully brought two bottles of it. Uh, and I say thankfully because the first take, I didn't get everything done that I wanted to, so I had to go and do another one. And this is at like eight o'clock in the morning on a Sunday because that's <laughs> the time I can get to the hall, you know. Um, and so the first one didn't go the way I wanted to, so I immediately sat down and ran another take. And as I'm putting all the gear away, I'm like, wow, I'm wasted. This is <laughs> this is the most fun I've ever had wrapping cable. I think. <laughs> this is, yeah. Um, so yeah, it, uh, there's there's a lot of people playing with a lot of different ideas, you know. You but but that's part of the fun. And I'm actually I am on that particular work. I'm kind of open to interpretation on that. You know, if somebody wants to put together 
a laptop ensemble and get a six pack and do six beers across the stage, great. You know, get yeah. a big laptop ensemble and buy a keg and everybody can, you know, just right. take tapping the keg part of the ritual of, of I mean, I could see like two schools getting together with their composition studios and doing a case race or something yeah, <laughs> with the piece. I just want to see <laughs> how they do the keg stand. Exactly. <laughs> to, the, to the work, you know? Oh, but, yeah. Well, you could do a beer pong version, too. Yeah, I like that, too. Yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah cool. You need a mixer, though, in order to <laughs> mic every cup. Yeah. Awesome. That's awesome. brilliant. Cool. So, well, so, um... So, Dave, are time was. are you there? I'm. I'm here. Okay, uh, your you video is frozen again. Go so. for it. Just ignore it. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, the only other thing I really wanted to uh, to bring up uh, was the idea of uh, when you're teaching. Um, I've seen your uh, your video of your students exploring the no input mixer. Yeah. Have uh, watched and been awed by the Juwan Park uh, large intestine. Yeah. idea and that's something that i've been working with a lot with my own students um in software at least is uh kind of exploring the wrong way to do things as a creative method um yeah. you know you take the pitch output and you don't plug it into the pitch input on the synthesizer you plug it into uh i don't know gate so you have a constant fluctuation going mm -hmm. um how do you see your students responding to that and is that giving them new ideas or are they uh, freaked out about that? <laughs> I, th I think more the former than the latter. Okay. You know, I think it's it is really important to, um, you know, and this is just this is just simple pedagogy. But I think it is really important to think about the level of the student to, who, to whom you're introducing these sorts of things, you know? So I, I would never bring, I mean, I might show something like that in a freshman or a sophomore level course, but I wouldn't, you know, I, I would be very cautious about it because I'm, I'm still trying to establish the groundwork, you know? By the time my students get into the, the class where we're looking at that kind of stuff, which is, again, the electronic composition course, um, they're juniors or seniors. They've already, at that point, spent four full semesters working in Pro Tools and in Logic and with live sound reinforcement and microphone technique and mixing consoles. I mean, they, at that point, they probably could leave school and go find work as a sound tech somewhere, you know? Nice. And the remaining two years of coursework is all about extending those possibilities further. Um, and so a big part of that course for me, a big part of teaching electronic composition is covering some of the history of the art form as well as contemporary work being done in, in the art form uh, because they don't get that elsewhere. You know, in the typical music history survey, which is what we have here, you know, we're lucky if they get much beyond, you know, if we're lucky if they get to World War II, much less beyond World War II, you know? Um, and electronic music, I mean, aside from, I think they, they do hear poem electronic, they, you know, they hear the Verez, and I they know it exists, but that's about it. So I see a big part of the mission of that course is to be, okay, well, here's all the other stuff that happened that you didn't get in history class, and here's what people are doing today. And so really, for about the last month of that course, every day that I come in, I bring in some YouTube videos or I bring in some recordings of you know contemporary work and say, here's a piece that I heard at an ICMC, or here's a piece that I heard at an SCI, or wherever it is, you know. I know this composer, I've talked to this composer, I know what he or she is doing, and, and this is this is your chance to see what's going on. Um, and then any time that I can extend that to the idea of saying, and now why, why, why don't you guys get a chance to play with this technique, you know, so much the better. Um, and so that's where the, the no input mixer thing came from. You know, and Juwan has been doing this fantastic 100 sounds project that he just finished. I don't know if you guys saw that last week. Um, but. Um, that particular work is, is I think, one of the, the best ones in the series. And they're, yeah. all, they're all good, but that particular one is really good. Um, and so I brought it in, and, and all these guys who think they know about mixing consoles, they see this video, and they're like, "What? wait, what? What's happening? <laughs> you know, and I followed that up with that great um, Christian Carrier uh, video of him playing Fratris on No Input Mixer. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but it's amazing. Uh, um, I haven't seen that one, but I'm going well, to YouTube very soon after we're done. Check it. It's amazing. Um, He's got each of the channels tuned just right to give him the pitches of oh. other parents' fratres, and then he plays it by moving the faders up and down. You know, uh, it's wonderful. Um, wow. And the uh, 
So anyway, so I showed them those two things, and then I said, and here's a little tiny mixing console, so go nuts. And for the last half of the class, they just had a blast patching stuff in and seeing, seeing what happened. But, you know, the idea of um, using stuff incorrectly, um, yeah, I, I very much agree with that. I think that that's where a lot of the most interesting work occurs in, the, in technologically related fields, um, is when you take this tool that's supposed to do this job, and you say, well, what happens if we make it do that job? Um, a lot of times that gets really, really interesting. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. um, I actually taught a course in our honors college, not for music majors, for any honors college student um, a few years back, um, that was uh, technology and the arts, which is kind of an intersection of these kinds of things. And that was one of the assignments that I gave them, actually. I said, I want you to go to whatever your normal day-to-day -day stuff is. If you're a business major, open up Excel. You know, if you're a, a drafting major, open up AutoCAD, whatever it is that you normally use that is technology. And I want you to come up with a way to use it wrong. I want you to come up with a way to do something you're not supposed to do with it and just see what happens. And it might suck, but it, sometimes it's really, really cool. And if you do it enough times, you'll, you'll get to stuff that nobody else has gotten to, and that's, that's part of the interesting part of doing art. I yeah. think. Yeah. I, and I think using, using it wrong, I think, is... is yeah, yeah that, that to me is, is like a big lesson in computer yeah. music and in, in art in general and everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Right. You know, like in your picture right now, you've got that SM58 sitting in front of you, and for some reason, it's making me think of Ben Burtt's great sound design work in Star Wars. You know, where part yeah. of the sound of the lightsaber was taking a 57 and actually acting out the scene in front of the speaker, <laughs> yep. and that's got all the Doppler on it. You know, um, <laughs> I'm just the rest of development in my head right now with uh, the guy, <laughs> the broom. Um, but uh, you know, the um, that's a perfect example of using the technology technically incorrectly, but getting, I mean, a genre-defining result out of it. It's yeah. amazing, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think it's, I think it a lot of times can be really, really powerful. Yeah. Well, well thanks so much. I think we're going to move on to our last segment of the show today. Um, if for those of you who've, uh, who've watched our show before, Patch In ends with a two-minute challenge every month. So it's Ben's turn this time. And Ben, what are you going to talk about? Uh, well, Nate, I'm going to try and do microphone transducers. All right. <laughs> or at least the three major types that I find, anyway. All right. Okay. Well, here <clears throat> we go. You Are you ready for this? We got two minutes on the clock, so to speak. <laughs> I'm going to try to restart my video so you can see what's going on. Oh, no, we we're good. Oh, we can I, see you. Oh, you can see me yeah. now? Cool. Yeah. You ready? Sure. Do it. Okay, the transducer is how a microphone converts an audio signal into an electrical signal. Uh, there are three main types. They have a variety of advantages and weaknesses, but they all do the same thing. So first up, you have dynamic. Basically, you have a diaphragm attached to magnets, and the magnets are within a coil. So when the sound hits the diaphragm, it attacks the magnet and moves it back and forth within the coil, creating an electrical signal via the principle of magnetic induction. Uh, this is also, in the reverse, how speakers and headphones work, which is why in a pinch you can take your headset and talk into it as if it were a dynamic microphone. They're simple to make, cheap, rugged, don't need power, and can handle high pressure levels, but they only have an effective range of about a foot, so you can't use them for orchestral recording. Uh, but they're cheap, so you can find them everywhere. Condensers, or capacitor microphones, which is another name for condensers, work just like that. You have metal plate one, metal plate two, positive charge, negative charge, sound hits them, they vibrate closer together, that creates an electrical signal. As I said, they require power, so you have to hook them up to a board or a battery, uh, but they're more sensitive, they have a larger range, you can get stereo pairs very easily to do orchestral recording, and the cool thing is they have really, really natural high ends. So they sound a lot better in some instances. The other one that you commonly see is ribbon mics. So you have two magnets and then a metal ribbon in between. Uh, same principle as the dynamic mic. It vibrates, although in this case it's bi-directional, so you can record in a figure eight pattern. Uh, that creates induction and comes out as an electrical signal. Uh, do not give them power, however, because in the case of a lot of the older ones, they will fry. Fortunately, Royer and some of the other manufacturers have fixed that with modern ones, and the use of nanomaterials and new ribbon mics makes them much, much, much better, and that's all the time we have. 
<laughs> Not bad. And, okay. <laughs> Not yeah. bad. Didn't get to carbon mics or uh, fiber optics or contacts, but that's uh, another. Yeah. Maybe you should. Maybe we should do a separate one just for contacts. Right. Because uh, yeah. that's there's a lot of different kinds of those too. What you should do is build a contact mic in two minutes or less. Oh, <laughs> that's a good one. That's a great two minute challenge. It doesn't take that much longer than two minutes. No, you probably could come really close. If you if Why you prepared it, I'm if you did like the cooking show MacBook. style thing where yeah. you've got like two, three of them at different stages and you like, you know, put yeah. two in the top oven and it comes out six in the bottom oven, you could totally yeah. do it in two minutes. I think that's a great idea, Eric. <laughs> Nice well, job, maybe, Ben. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Good, good work. So maybe we'll work on contact mics next month. <laughs> Speaking it's about your it, turn, Nate. Perhaps even building yeah. it. Yeah, I know. So, uh, well, we'll see. <laughs> we'll have to learn how to make a... So I've, I've, I've used an element and connected it to other things before, but I've never actually com com constructed the plates and stuff. And so I'm, yeah. I'm going to go learn how to do that, I think. But that about does it for Patch In 7. Uh, Eric, Honor, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Um, nice yeah. Do you, um, do you have any things coming up that you'd like to plug? I try to do this earlier in the show. But, yeah, what, um, what's going on? Well, my, my, I've got two different um, commissions that I'm working on for the summer. And the, the more electronically related of those is um, I was fortunate enough with uh, Kyung Mi Choi and Morgan Krauss. Uh, of two other composers, we um, are working with flutist Shana Gutierrez on new works for her new Eva Kingma system open hole bass flute and electronics. Nice. Um, and she took the lead on it and wrote a grant for the inaugural New Music USA grant. So we got funding from the, that first round of New Music USA grants. So we're super excited about the project. The, the flute is amazing. I don't know if you guys have seen it or not, but it's, it's unbelievable. Um, and Shauna, of course, is internationally known. I mean, she's an extraordinary flutist. Um, so I'm actually really thrilled to get the chance to write for somebody that plays as well as she does, because it means I can really write something impossible. You know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, that's going to be for for flute. And actually, from the get go, part of the idea is to see, you know, is it possible to do beatboxing on the bass flute? And if so, what can you do with that? And how, what happens if you then mix that with granular processing? So that's my big project for the summer so wonderful we perform something nice. in the fall. awesome <laughs> well thanks again we'll look forward to that new piece from you eric honor um and so this is uh patch in seven thanks for joining us um i'm nate blighton and <laughs> i'm ben, ben Furman. yeah and uh thanks again for watching we'll, we'll see you next month um please support sound notion it's uh you can go to soundnotion.tv and we've got an Amazon affiliate link, which is places to make different kinds of donation. But you can see our shows and other shows, uh, Sound Notion, uh, Streamers and Punches, and uh, check it out at soundnotion.tv. This uh, patch in is at soundnotion.tv slash PI, where you can get in the iTunes store or wherever you download your podcasts. But thanks again. This is Patch In. We'll see you next month.